365 days ago, we sang that response to the reading of Genesis 1. And today, we complete our year of the Bible. Over this last year, we have walked through the entirety of Scripture. I want to thank you for going on this journey. And I hope that our Monday devotionals, small group lessons, introductory videos, and sermons have been helpful as you have sought to find where your life intersects with the sacred word of God. It may have left you confused and with more questions than answers. If so, that's a good thing. An easy, uncritical faith is dangerous. The complexity of Scripture is what keeps us engaging it as a living word to shape our life in the present. We come to our conclusion today, then, and we meet John of Patmos with this action film version of the end of history. It's strange and confusing and weird, and people have many interpretations about what's going on here. So maybe a little background will be helpful. John is a traveling Jewish Christian evangelist and pastor. He has relationships with several different congregations around Asia Minor, and he has for some reason ended up in exile on the island of Patmos, and he's worried about the congregations that he loves. And so John writes them this letter, this apocalypse. He knows that these churches are under pressure from the Roman authorities to accommodate their way of life to the way of the empire. The pressure is to keep their faith private and not to let it affect their social or economic realities. You see, if you were a merchant in that time, it would have been expected that you would have gone with the other merchants to the Roman merchant god and made your sacrifices and offered your prayers. And so the merchant wants to be able to continue doing that even while worshiping Jesus Christ as Lord on the first day of the week. Because if he did go to the Roman merchant god, he might get kicked out of the guild. He might have to close his business. He might lose his livelihood. Others are worried that if they break down the classist social barriers that are maintained in Roman society between the wealthy and the peasants, that they will be ostracized from their sociable friends who they want a relationship with. So hang out with those other people at church, but don't dare be seen with them in the marketplace or have those peasants over to your house or or be seen helping those folks. So the Christians in John's churches want to accommodate their lives to the ways of the empire, to be quiet Christians who live under the radar of their neighbors and the power structure of Rome. We read in Revelation 2 that there has also been some persecution of Christians that's flared up. It hasn't been systemic across the whole empire, but they've met some resistance. At least one person has been killed for his Christian faith. And so fear is also a motivator behind these Christians to sort of keep themselves under wraps and and keep quiet. John's vision then places the ordinary days of these Christians within a grand cosmic story. John wants them to know you aren't just merchants and neighbors and citizens. You are witnesses to the lordship of Jesus Christ and to the Lamb. The very end of this cosmic story then is what we read today. It's a vision of a new heaven and a new earth descending on the old world. It's the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. That would be a powerful image if you were a Roman citizen. See, one of the nicknames for the city of Rome was the Eternal City. They engraved it on their coins. So every piece of money you had said the Eternal City. John is here describing a new Jerusalem descending on top of the Eternal City of Rome. So even though Rome looks invincible and powerful now, the end is coming from God. The new Jerusalem is where we're headed. Now, I have to interject at this point. Um, This happens every time you talk about Revelation. Um, It's particularly a challenge for engineers. 
okay? They have a hard time with mystery. They like things to be linear. So this is not literally a blueprint of a new city that's going to come from outer space down on top of Rome in Italy, okay? Uh, Dress like a bride. I don't even know what that would look like. Is it a veil? Is it a train? A big white drape? I don't know. So this is, this is John's attempt to use human language and image to point to a reality that is beyond what we can actually define and describe. Sort of like how your heart can be stirred by a beautiful symphony or by an incredible piece of art that speaks to truth that words themselves are inadequate to express. That's what's happening here with the New Jerusalem. But it is important to pay attention to what images the Holy Spirit inspires John to use. The first, he says, is that the New Jerusalem descends on the earth. I don't know why we missed that in our popular theology and especially in gospel hymns. I'll fly away and things like this. John does not understand that the world works that when you die, Your body is put in the ground, and your soul is whisked off to outer space where we all live on a cloud planet that looks like a place in Star Wars, okay? John has, for his churches, a vision of heaven coming down to earth. God's going to redeem this creation, not whisk us away to some other heavenly place. Second, John tells us that God dwells with the people. God's no longer distant or understood as this sort of inner working of the Holy Spirit. God is present, and God cares for the people intimately. God wipes their tears. God eliminates pain and sorrow and death. And then God speaks. God only speaks twice in the book of Revelation, so it's kind of important to pay attention to what God says. And God declares, behold, I make all things new. That's important also. God does not say, behold, I make all new things. God isn't starting over. God is redeeming, reclaiming. God is restoring. Those images are really important to John's goal when he casts this cosmic vision. Jerusalem descends. God is intimately present. God cares for the people's sorrow and pain and wipes them out. God makes all things new. John is telling his churches who are at risk of abandoning their faithfulness for a life that is safer and more comfortable in the present, hey guys, we are ultimately headed towards a redeemed world. Rome is not the eternal city. Ours is the new creation. And since we know where we're finally going to end up, why shouldn't our lives be focused each day on preparing the world for that ultimate destination? Dr. Brian Blunt, who's the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, puts it this way in his commentary on Revelation. John's vision redeems the earth as part of God's good creation and as the locus of God's grand recreation. A witness for God and the Lamb does not dream of escaping the world. A witness for God and the Lamb works with God to transform the world. The goal then is not to escape the present reality but to be part of the scout team, the cavalry, the the setup crew for God's consummation of all things. Our job as followers of Jesus is to spend each day in our city and in our communities rolling out the red carpet so that when the lamb comes, there is a place where he knows he can go to sit on his throne. And we participate in that preparation when we love those that nobody else loves. We do that as we pray and we sing praises to God instead of promoting our own ego and relying only on our own abilities. We do that as we practice repentance 
and forgiveness in our relationships and conduct our business and structure our communities in ways that wipe tears from eyes and seek to eliminate suffering and sorrow and death. 